the right time to start. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just take a a couple of minutes um, just to welcome everybody and introduce uh, Serge. Uh, and uh, for those who may not know Serge, I, I I hardly believe we will have that many people in the audience that uh, that have not directly or indirectly um, communicated or worked with Serge. But uh, so first of all, welcome to. Um, a mass center, uh, a special event. Um, um, so mass center, we provide all sorts of training courses, uh, webinars, uh, tutorials, etc., to um, to professionals in the field of hardware security, microelectronic security. But um, um, we um, we also include um, additional activities to increase. Uh, engagement between uh, community and uh, stakeholders, decision makers, uh, program managers, thought leaders, um, technology leaders, etc. And this is one of those special events. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, we've got a, quite a bit of crowd. And um, it is really uh, my, uh, my pleasure to have uh, Serge with us today to uh, be part of this rather very informal conversation about the state of the uh, microelectronics and hardware security. So I'm going to make a quick intro to Serge. Uh, uh, Mr. Serge Leaf uh, joined DARPA in August 2018 as a program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office, known as MTO. His interests include uh, computer architecture, chip design tools, hardware security, he is managing um, um, many programs that aim to truly advance the state of the art in chip design technologies while making hardware security pervasive. He is engaging with academic researchers and the industry to rethink the fundamental chip design tools, algorithms, methodologies, and semiconductor IP in the context of emerging computational opportunities where cloud and domain specific high performance architectures can be truly exploited. To address a giga size and nano scale challenges expected in the near future. The technology areas being pursued are the most uh, computationally invasive, uh, intensive and hard to scale applications like digital and analog simulations, uh, synthesis, floor planning, placement, routing, etc. He's also working on strategies for um, facilitation of US based chip startup ecosystems. Uh, with that, first let me thank the uh, thank Serge. I know how how busy you are with uh, with the number of programs that you're managing, and it's really a pleasure and honor to have you today with us. Uh, we uh, would like to start with you, uh, Serge, just to provide a an opening remark, and then I will uh, uh, talk about certain rules with our audience as they as they're joining in, and, and I'll start the questions. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you for kind words and uh, an introduction. Um, yes, uh, I have been at DARPA for a little bit over three years, and it's been uh, almost certainly the best job I ever had. Uh, this is this is kind of a unique opportunity where you are brought into the agency for your vision and then given essentially uh, uh, potentially limitless resources uh, to pursue it as long as the vision serves the two core objectives of DARPA, which is enhancement of national security and uh, improvement of US economic competitiveness. And of course, it has to fit the DARPA mission and the vision of the office that I'm working in, which is MTO. So um, having said that, I do have a, a, a substantial a program portfolio, which at this point I think is around $350 million. And, um, uh, it consists of a number of sub portfolios. So the first of this is uh, security. Uh, and I focus only on hardware security. There are others that focus on the interface between hardware and software and certainly other offices uh, at the software and system level security. So in the security portfolio, we have um, uh, a program that's uh, more or less wrapped up at this point called Shield which was a tiny chiplet that contains a hardware root of trust, the key store, RF and anti-tamper mechanisms. We have ACE, which is a synthesis of secure SOCs that takes us from 
architecture to RTL. Um, and then we have a number of smaller explorations around um, uh, how do we add security to high-level synthesis. Uh, there is an exploration around uh, design rule checking at RTL gate level and layout. There is uh, another effort that's developing side channel and fault injection attack simulator. Um, and we're, we're also developing a concept around uh, Trojan detection using formal static and dynamic analysis methods that hasn't been rolled out yet. Additionally, in that area, we're looking at um, physical design phase, namely RTL to GDS2, and are developing two programs on how to detect vulnerabilities uh, to optical probing and fault injection, and then how to mitigate them automatically and how to do you know, security versus timing closure trade-offs. It, the second portfolio is EDA, where I have uh, programs like IDEA, POSH. Uh, those are uh, uh, open source EDA and open source uh, IP uh, programs. Um, and I also have RTML, which is uh, translation or synthesis of machine learning models into uh, accelerators, either standalone or embedded into larger SOCs or ASICs. We have a significant uh, new program development that's going on in this area on next generation cloud-based uh, digital verification environment. And here we're investing in uh, some initial explorations in this area, like applying AI to automatically produce reduced order models, uh, reviving uh, to some extent um, uh, speculative uh, parallelism-based uh, simulation techniques and accelerating them in hardware and looking at further raising abstraction uh, uh, beyond the uh, TLM. I also have a couple of programs in, uh, that focus on domestic microelectronics um, and uh, several uh, others uh, in development like distributed system simulation optimization. I also uh, have uh, this initiative called Toolbox to bring uh, low-cost EDA and IP uh, tools to uh, low-cost EDA tools and IP to DARPA performers. So that's uh, kind of a whirlwind tour of my portfolio, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first um, 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 tell audience what we expect in the next, um, you know, 50 minutes. Um, I do have a set of questions that I already uh, very briefly shared with with Serge. In fact, it was just last night, just for him to know what sort of questions we're going to be asking, but the objective is not really just to go through only my questions. I would love to get your questions and so send them our way, uh, put them into the chat box. Um, I'll try to be selective with the questions just because I'm gonna create a flow of the discussions and, uh, but I'll try my best to, to get to your questions. So with that, uh, Serge, majority of the folks on the call today, um, uh, I, looked, I looked at the list very quickly. I think majority come from the background of microelectronic security. So, um, you know, um, tell us more about your vision when it comes to uh, microelectronic security and what makes, um, um, what do what you think that some of your programs, especially understanding um, um, ACE very well, uh, being part of it, et cetera, what, what makes these programs for, for you and, 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 and for DARPA a successful effort? Well, um, you know, the, the key success metrics, as I've already mentioned, is uh, national security and economic competitiveness arguments that have to be supported. Uh, but um, uh, hardware security is a major focus area for uh, MTO. And so um, there is appetite to do more. Um, we are in constant uh, consultation with the community, including yourself, Mark, about what are the most impactful things that, uh, that we could do in this area. But um, I guess the important thing for the community, to, the way to think about it is that you need to find the resonance with one of the PMs in the, in the office, uh, either an MTO or I2O or TTO, uh, uh, that uh, with whom your ideas resonate and match their vision. So a lot of people make a mistake of uh, pitching ideas to uh, office uh, leadership, like uh, the director and deputy director. And the answer is there is always going to be the same. You got to get one of the PMs interested. Yeah. Because the, the leadership doesn't actually define programs, doesn't uh, manage them, and doesn't uh, have um, metrics associated with uh, 
you know, very specific elements of success. But um, in general, uh, this, the program success these days um, uh, is a lot is is uh, correlated quite a bit to transition ability. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, for ACE, uh, we have uh, basically two teams. One of which is um, focusing on developing really transformational system synthesis approach that embeds the security into the fabric of the design. <clears throat> Uh, perhaps sometimes down to microarchitecture level, and um, and that has a really strong there's strong argument that this is going to transition because the performers include leading EDA and leading IP vendors who presumably will be motivated to incorporate this into their commercial product lines, thus um, in the you know making commercial tools um, uh, support the concept of pervasive security. On the other hand, we have another team that's doing a variant of this, uh, pursuing the same goals, but this other team is like keenly aware of the DOD specific requirements. And so that is influences the directional and strategic choices that they're making in their design. So to me, this is sort of a poster child for how the transition really should be engineered, uh, where you have two prongs. One, one path leads to transition into commercial markets, and the other path leads to transition to um, DOD use cases, which is appropriate because it is DOD that is uh, making all this possible with their funding. Outstanding. So, um, Serge, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of the folks on the call um, uh, in the Zoom today, they're very curious to know uh, whether um, you will have some new programs coming out. Uh, you briefly mentioned about the interest in um, going from RTL down to physical design. Um, uh, I personally firmly believe that uh, some of the security issues at the physical designs are going to be extremely important and must be taken into account. Are there programs that you're considering? You mentioned about Trojan. Are there programs that are out there uh, for public to know so that they could uh, they could talk to you about? Um, so, so it's it's kind of an interesting dance the way this works. So. We end up reaching out to the community to either uh, look for problems that are interesting to solve and relevant and fit our mission or to calibrate program concepts so that they make sense. This has an effect of getting the community excited and uh, the community is now expecting a program to roll out. But uh, what's happening back in the sausage factory of DARPA is that we now have to take this program concept and we have to first make it fit a rather elaborate um, uh, socket uh, that qualifies it to be a DARPA program. In other words, there is a whole number of considerations that have to be uh, uh, articulated in a very particular way so that it fits DARPA mission. And it has to be done hierarchically. First, it has to be done at the office level, then it has to be solved at the director's level. And this process, quite frankly, is highly iterative and frequently takes, uh, you know, six months. And uh, I, you know, not just me, my predecessors have spent like four years at DARPA and they haven't succeeded in pushing more than one program through um, because it is really complex. So we are dealing with taxpayer money and uh, this is... Um, there is incredible amount of scrutiny that goes along with everything. So DARPA has this philosophy that has been created over you know, 63 years of its existence that is viewed as extremely successful. And so that means this program concepts have to really fit into this DARPA socket before they get uh, approved. And so what happens, what I see happening with uh, you know, folks that I interact with is we discuss the concept and they sort of assume that there's going to be a BAA that's going to drop in the next couple of weeks. But uh, for us, it's just the beginning of the journey. Uh, now that we and the community have consensus on what's the right thing to do and what's the right approach, now the burden is on myself and my team to make this work, uh, you know, in the context of the DARPA mission. And uh, it is quite frequently a struggle because uh, I think uh, uh, everybody at the approval in the approval chain takes uh, maybe unintentionally adversarial position because they are sort of thinking, okay, what you know, they're going to be questioned by the next level of the government as to why this is. So everything needs to be really, really solid, well argued, well articulated. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex process. That's why there isn't necessarily a, a direct timing correlation between 
us, uh, you know, having meetings with uh, potential performers related to physical security and basically zeroing in on the right problem definition that, that me and my team think is the, uh, makes a program and then getting that approved by the, by the office and then the director's office. It's, it's a journey. Um, so uh, I, I actually was so long with it here, I forgot your original question. What, what, what were you saying? <laughs> So, so um, because I've been there, I've been, I've been listening and said, yeah, some of the pain that you're talking about, I can relate to it as well. Uh, but uh, because... So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. To... Okay, I, I remember the question. Mark, so, so to, 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 to uh, kind of finish the story is uh, the most complicated thing actually in government is contracting. So okay. what you need to do is you need to not only make sure that this thing fits a particular mission and socket type of arguments, but... It, you also need to find a proper contracting vehicle to execute this. And those range from seedlings to super seedlings to uh, micro electronics explorations to small programs to medium programs to large programs. And depending on which vehicle you go with, you're going to get different levels of scrutiny and different questions that you have to answer. So that's uh, the art of this is, uh, you know, taking a concept that we all want to do as, let's say, EDA or security research community, and then pounding into the socket until it fits. Yeah. So I guess the, 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 the summary and the message is that uh, don't give up, bring in new ideas. We're going to do whatever we can to try to see. Oh, if uh, no question. And the less money it is, actually, the easier it is to, uh, to, uh, to get it uh, through the system. Uh, like the seedlings uh, are, um, you know, we've had a lot of success with getting those through. Um, you know, the major programs uh, is tough. I mean, I, I have some peers uh, that started at the same time with me uh, at DARPA that maybe have had a single program approved in three years or maybe none. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have this, you know, dozen things uh, or more going on, but um, it, it's a difficult process. So it is, a, it, it, you know, uh, but what I keep telling myself when I deal with this is, Serge, don't complain. You had to work a lot harder to get a couple million dollars when you were uh, in the corporate world than you have to work for at DARPA to get, you know, 100 million. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's very uh, a nice way to say. Um, so I want to slowly transition to um, one of the hot topics of the day, and that's called chip shortage, right? Um, what's your view on it? And you, 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 you hear about Intel talking about uh, uh, moving into uh, Pure Play Foundry, possibly. They, they talked about acquiring global foundries. You hear TSMC talking about building a foundry in Arizona and all that. First, start with chip shortage and then talk about all of these activities. And then, of course, uh, we're going to get to the chip act as well. Yeah, so so I, I guess, um, you know, my uh, I'm sort of puzzled how the, the media spins the uh, chip shortage because they sort of treat, treat the chips as if they were like uh, uh, a commodity. Like there is this notion of chips that are sold by the pound and there's not enough of them. And so the subtlety of... Um, you know, multiple, you know, hundreds or thousands of different designs that are, you know, finely tuned to particular applications is uh, is miss is missing in the media narrative. Um, as far as the shortage is concerned, I think to me that uh, again, and I'll state this now for the record, I, my opinions are mine alone, and they do not represent those of DARPA or the Department of Defense. That's why I don't have DARPA background here uh, as I'm talking to you guys. I just have the fuzzed out view of my office. So, so I just want to highlight that this are my opinions. Um, so, um, so my, my opinion is that the chip shortage is related to the pandemic. Uh, in the early days of pandemic, uh, frankly, it looked like it could be, you know, end of days. So, uh, so, so everybody, including the manufacturers, uh, prepared for, you know, Great Depression and uh, wound down production. And now it's going to take a long time to get this all revved up because it's a really, really complex multi-tiered supply chain. So I think that's the, the basic thing. But uh, you asked the more interesting questions that follow, which is Intel moved to uh, Pure, Pure Play Foundry. And uh, here, my opinion is this. Uh, uh, Pure Play Foundry is a services business. 
Mm -hmm. You know, is Intel really ready for that? I mean, they've always been a technology-centric company. Uh, you know, I'm skeptical that it's in their DNA to be a services uh, business. It's a machine tuned to produce massive volumes of, of highly differentiated silicon. It would take a major culture change for them to succeed. I was uh, at Intel uh, a long time ago when Intel decided to enter ASIC business. And because, because they thought, hey, we have, uh, we have the, all the technology uh, and manufacturing capability necessary to do this. And they, and they did not succeed because they missed the fact that ASIC vendors are a services companies. Uh, the companies at the time were like LSI Logic and BTI and so on. And so Intel uh, pulled back from this and back to being a machine that makes microprocessors. And so um, I, I hope they succeed, but I think it's the, the culture that, that, that is um, prerequisite for success in this area is kind of different from you know, what uh, Intel has developed through its existence. As far as acquiring global foundries, I also think this is kind of odd. So, um, you know, uh, uh, what exactly are you buying here? Uh, you already have the fabs. You already have the people who know how to run the, run the fabs. You, uh, you have test engineering, you have product engineering. In short, it's sort of like um, you already own the kitchen, you have all the ingredients, you have recipes, you have the cooks. Uh, and you're gonna say, well, I'm just gonna buy a restaurant. Uh, that doesn't that brings its own set of those things that may or may not be better than what I already have. Mm -hmm. so, so to me, the the uh, more uh, it, it, the strategy that makes more sense to me, and you know, Intel obviously is not asking me for my advice, but uh, is to uh, to leverage the resources that Intel has and let them run free. Do what IBM did to start personal computer business take a bunch of uh, people, separate them from corporate politics, relocate them somewhere away from Santa Clara <laughs> and uh, let them be, give them two or three foundries uh, and, that, and maybe hire a bunch of people from global foundries that know what they're doing. Uh, that would be a much cheaper way to solve the problem in my opinion than to, the, to, just, to just purchase a business model. Um, and then TSMC building foundry in Arizona as uh, somebody who spent a lot of time in Arizona, has family there. I, I like Arizona. Uh, I think it's, a, it's great. Uh, there's talent in that area. There's, there are business friendly local governments. It's land is inexpensive. Uh, the only thing that uh, I'm not sure about, and I'm sure there's an answer for this. I just don't in, see what that is, is like semiconductor manufacturing requires a lot of water. And this is the place where, you know, there's a, a central Arizona project which connects the whole Phoenix area to uh, Colorado River and and that's potentially threatened supply. So I don't know why or how, um, you know, water is gonna get to this, uh, to this foundries in the Phoenix area. So, but that's just perhaps my ignorance. I'm sure they have all the answers to this question. Yeah, thank you. Um... So let's fall, let's 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 continue that discussion with the uh, with uh, with the Chip Act, and uh, uh, it's already passed uh, Senate, uh, sits in the Congress, I believe, not approved yet, but um, one would assume that that's going to happen. Uh, what difference uh, you think that Chip Act would make? Well, um, so uh, so first of all, uh, in my opinion, nobody actually knows how any of this is going to play out. So even people in the Senate and the House, uh, they're allocating money and high level guidance, I think, to, to what's going to happen. But if you look at the uh, DOD uh, ecosystem, for instance, there are a lot of uh, uh, positions in the government that are unfilled that would be presumably people that would participate in the process of translating money into some kind of actionable and executable plans. This thing is probably going to be, not probably, I think it's going to be executed by the Department of Commerce, which is another twist. The, 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 I don't know what um, uh, the in-house uh, expertise Department of Commerce has, or if they're planning to rely on uh, consultants or um, you know, big industry uh, players. Bottom line is anybody who claims at this point that they know what is going to happen here, they can't know. 
because this, like I said, this is even bigger sausage factory. Something, uh, something is happening there. You have no idea what the end product is going to be that's going to come up. What I do know is that, um, you know, what, what I keep hearing about uh, and uh, what I would like, what I would like to see happen. And so uh, this, this really it may be a small element of the whole uh, thing is I hear occasional talk that, um, you know, uh, IMAC in Europe is viewed as a successful um, structure that represents collaboration and partnership between government, academia, uh, industry and startup ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, I hear it mentioned occasionally that something like an IMAC model might be, uh, you know, worth replicating in the US. Um, I mean, it seems like IMAC is successful. I don't have any hard data, whether it is or not, but um, uh, to me, that would, be, that would be an interesting kind of thing. I, uh, you know, I've been on this uh, point for a long time that uh, U.S. Uh, startup uh, ecosystems for a uh, fabulous semiconductor company is in terrible shape uh, because it's really expensive to get to first working silicon and uh, VCs shy away from that segment because of that. It's much cheaper for them to invest in software and internet companies than in, in hardware startups. This to me, it represents an opportunity for U.S. government to step in and uh, fix the economics problem uh, and then step out pretty quickly. So that's that. It's my general view, not as a DARPA PM, but as a citizen, that the government role is to identify economic uh, dysfunction, step in to attempt to fix it, to change the equation uh, and step out just as quickly. Okay, not stay in there and create massive bureaucracies that are intrinsically inefficient. Um, so I, I am kind of concerned that uh, this act is going to be subject to a lot of lobbying and uh, the people uh, in the government may have an old fashioned view of what constitutes something like a consortium and maybe the argument will be about existing plants in some, some locations. And, and I think the world has sort of moved on to being a lot more virtual and physical buildings and you know, uh, don't really matter all that much. And location of physical plants is also not particularly important. So uh, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Anybody who claims they know what the outcome of this is going to be cannot know. Um, the, the, uh, and so, uh, again, Department of Commerce is in the lead, I think. And uh, I know my, my immediate uh, manager is involved in conversations there, but uh, I don't think DARPA is... Uh, I don't know what DARPA's role is in this whole process. I hope that DARPA has a strong voice as this thing is shaped because we have a lot of people in, at DARPA who are experts in uh, and around this uh, microelectronics area that would have strong opinions and high quality opinions, but I don't know if, uh, to what level we will be consulted. So um, I wanted to transition from uh, focusing on you know semiconductors to EDA, but there's a question in the in the chat box that I would like to ask you. So um, just to let everybody on the call also, um, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat box or just uh, um, raise your hand and uh, we'll uh, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. So. The question actually is uh, uh, something you mentioned earlier about seedlings. I want to make sure I get to that, and then we we we, we continue discussions around the EDA. And the question is, uh, the uh, you know, tell more tell more about seedlings, the size of seedlings, and expectation. Perhaps maybe a thirty second or one minute answer to the question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can sort of give you an example of like a perfect seedling. Um, so there was uh, an approach to some problem that was discussed, articulated, explored uh, some time ago. It could be as long ago as the 80s. Um, at that time, everybody thought it was a good concept, but for some reasons, maybe insufficient computing, maybe uh, other technical reasons, it never went anywhere. Okay, so a great signature of uh, Seedling is some researcher is reviving this idea uh, and revisiting it due to uh, technology evolution. 
uh, either because uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, on the cloud or some kind of HPC can be built, or there are some truly new ideas that can make this technology that was contemplated a long time ago uh, suddenly come to life. And they demonstrate a prototype that shows a particular set of attributes. And that gets uh, a program manager excited and the program manager says, wow, how far can you push this? What if you were to replicate this, you know, 5,700 times? Do you go 5,700 times faster? What if you were to turn this into an ASIC? What if you were to turn it into, you know, an array of ASICs? Those are great questions for Seedling to ask. In other words, there's a core idea and the question is how far does it go? Is it generalizable? Is this, uh, and so, uh, and so seedlings classically, uh, you know, fit into this range of a couple hundred K to a million. And they typically go for, um, you know, a year to a year and a half in length. And the outcome of the seedling, if successful, essentially gives a program manager a good argument base to, uh, to support a bigger program in this area. So we had a seedling. It was proven that such and such actually works and scales. Now I want to propose a large program that um, based on this new finding, uh, you know, tries to solve a bigger and more relevant uh, uh, set of um, uh, challenges. Thank you. So let's move to um, EDA. I mean, this is, this is where you spent majority of your, uh, your, uh, your career. Um, uh, tell us more about what you think about the future of EDA. Where do you see EDA solutions and business model uh, be in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? We hear so much about uh, cloud-based environment. Uh, uh, your um, uh, toolbox is a good example. DARPA ACE established similar cloud environment. There are discussions and uh, uh, AWS and Microsoft are trying to provide this sort of cloud environment. Etc. And then, of course, where do you see security and privacy issues uh, arise when we move from uh, a desktop-based approach that we've done it for the past 30 years or 40 years now into a cloud environment? Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of questions there, but if I leave something off the table, uh, please bring it back. So, my, uh, so I spent my entire career in EDA, not just part of it, but uh, all of it. Uh, and so, as you might expect, I have a lot of observations and opinions as a result of that uh, run. And not um, necessarily on the EDA technology side, but on the EDA business side. So, uh, so, so my basic uh, view here is that um, the industry uh, has problems. It is the problem, foundation, fundamental problem is it is not, it hasn't found a way to proportionately benefit from enabling its customers. So EDA industry enables $300 billion semiconductor market. It in turn, which in turn enables over a trillion dollar electronics market. And the most EDA has ever been able to generate is about $10 billion. So there is a, there is a discrepancy here. Without EDA, these bigger markets could not, uh, could not be alive. And so, uh, the, the, there is a problem here because the, the business models that exist today do not uh, propagate the benefit, they do not truly reflect the value uh, of what the EDA industry delivers. Uh, I think that domination by the big three vendors is not particularly healthy. There's really no venture capital available for EDA startups. The only exits are you know, acquisition or uh, by the big three or by China which we are seeing more and more uh, often. So it, it's, uh, I don't want to use the word stagnant, but I think my personal opinion is like the last big transformational change in EDA was a design compiler uh, in 1988. Mm -hmm. This is something that truly tr changed the way in a, in a big and positive way, the way that we could design chips and nothing of that magnitude has come around since then. Um, so the, the improvements have been huge, of course, and but they, in my opinion, they've been largely linear. Um, and um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, not, not particularly re revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, 
so, you know, it seems like uh, if you've read Innovator's Dilemma, this was kind of like a perfect uh, signature for disruption. The disruption typically comes from below. And so here you would you would start thinking, so who could what, what could disrupt the industry? Well, you know, is it cloud? Is it open source? Is it open source on the cloud? In all cases, um, you know, there nothing is um, in place today that can really challenge the EDA uh, uh, big three as, as they are defined. Um, but there are some uh, uh, economic forces, I think, that are unfolding that uh, that could cause significant rethink. And that is that, um, you know, my, my observation is when I just started working in this industry and I was at Intel and corporate CAD, um, there was general belief that there was only about 5,000 people in the world who knew how to, to design a chip from beginning to end, from architecture down to polygons. We, we called it mentor, we called those people tall, thin designers. Mm -hmm. So somebody who could do the whole thing up to, to. And so there was belief back then that there was only 5,000 people in the world like that. And at the same time, there were 50,000 people in the world who could do software. Mm -hmm. So zoom forward to today. I would assert that the first number hasn't much changed. There's probably still around 5,000 people that you could characterize as tall thin designers. But uh, on the software and system side, there's probably uh, conservatively 50 million people in the world that know how to do uh, those things. And so what is happening here is I think there's a growing asymmetry that's emerging. There is uh, a number of... Um, small number of uh, companies that are designing big, complex, hairy platform chips, platforms intended for particular vertical segments. Yeah. And, uh, and those things are challenging the, the state of the art and process technology and scale, uh, everything. Uh, and then on the other side is a huge community that takes those platform chips and turns them into systems by adding value in system design, in software and uh, expansion. And so the, 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 the community that's doing big custom chips, they're, the, they're classical EDA users. And I think that their requirements may become so intense that they would start considering bringing EDA back in house. Yeah. Whereas the other people, the systems and software people, they are not really all that uh, uh, accepting of EDA business models. Uh, and because they represent much larger market, they would expect very different pricing. You know, like software people think paying $99 for a compiler is a lot of money. Uh, whereas, you know, EDA industry routinely charges, you know, list price of 50K per license of a digital simulator and nobody, nobody thinks that's a problem. So um, I, I think uh, uh, the, the key innovation that EDA needs to consider is business models. I think the business models uh, are kind of broken in EDA and uh, they uh, do not, if my vision of this bifurcation of the customer base is correct, the business model that they have only serves the small and shrinking group of designers that are going to be doing big complex chips and does not serve potentially much larger market uh, of system and software designers that are adding value around platforms. Thank you. You briefly mentioned about um, you know system developers. Um, every every ten or twenty years, you see some of these system developers start talking talking about their own platform specific chips, and we can hear a ton these days that Apple and Google and X and Y and Z companies are actually doing this more and more. How would that um, um, how would this work with regard to? you know, EDA on one side and then Foundry and then system developers now, they have their own chips that are being fabricated at the, at, at, at the, at the, at the very high level in terms, of, in terms of, you know, how aggressive they are, right? In, in, in I think, I, I think uh, those uh, companies that you're referring to, they are definitely starting from behind, uh, uh, except for Apple. Apple acquired a, a real hardware team to start their hardware business. But the others, uh, and I think it, that's true for Amazon as well, but, um, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, companies like Google, which has huge number of software engineers and very small number of hardware engineers, they're, they're definitely trying to do something different. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, consideration of open source uh, strategies. 
And that is part of the culture there because they believe open source worked really well for them on the software side. And the, I think there's thinking that they can benefit from that on the hardware side as well. But I think th th these people are going to evolve into being no different from normal EDA customers. They're going to become just like Qualcomm and uh, Samsung. Um, it just so happens that there are system companies that realize that they needed to do custom hardware and the evolutionary path they took towards that have been different. Um, but in case of, uh, you know, in the new economy, like Apple and Amazon definitely acquired companies with a lot of design expertise that that's relatively speaking makes them similar to conventional semiconductor companies in, in terms of design methodologies and uh, use flow, the use of tools. Very good. Just uh, focusing on that, um, system, uh, Steve is asking a question. So do you expect EDA to be absorbed by the IC or systems companies? Yeah, so, so what, I, what I'm kind of thinking here is you look at the three different, uh, three di very different players in EDA. Um, I think, uh, you know, Mentor sort of expanded more outside of core EDA and into PCB and systems consideration, which ultimately led them to become attractive to uh, Siemens. And so that, that is going in, uh, in kind of in the systems direction. I think Synopsys uh, has uh, made real effort to diversify their offerings into software and so on. Um, I believe they recognize the bifurcation, uh, you know, pattern that I mentioned and are responding to this. Uh, my observation is Cadence is pretty much focusing on this big complex uh, SOC, uh, SOCs and ICs. And so if there were somebody to be acquired by a fab uh, or a large semiconductor company, it would be somebody who can serve uh, well this, uh, you know, deep submicron design needs that may become too intense and too exotic for general market. And so I think it's un under those circumstances, a major foundry or a major uh, semiconductor company uh, would basically start thinking, you know, we want the uh, place and route to go in a particular direction and we can't force the commercial vendors to go in that direction just by voting with our money. So maybe we should buy them. So I think, uh, I, I think it's less likely that, um, you know, more broadly, uh, uh, the, the company like Synopsys with a very broad product line uh, would fit that uh, uh, profile, but uh, somebody like Cadence, who's really, uh, I think, uh, you know, has phenomenal tools for customizing design and, uh, you know, uh, is recognized as definitely a leader in physical implementation. Um, I think that profile actually fits better uh, this uh, uh, acquisition question. Very good. Uh, Kevin, you raise your hand. Uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, sorry, Joe. Um, I just have a question. Um, so regarding HPCUs, uh, one of the challenges that we were faced with is this, I call it the digital divide, where uh, most HPCUs don't have the capacity the, and infrastructure to, to uh, you know, get engaged with a lot of these efforts. So um, what do you think, if any, what role can DARPA play in helping uh, HBCUs uh, to level the playing field so that we can cut up uh, because we have a lot of value to add in terms of particularly to the workforce. Uh, so, so, so remind me what H HBCU is? Uh, historically Black College and University. Ah, yes. Okay, got it. Um, uh, and you're saying uh, that the uh, the infrastructure is sort of lacking uh, to be competitive, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah this is, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I can, you know, comment on policy level uh, uh, decisions here, but I know that uh, for my programs, uh, we specifically have been looking for uh, opportunities to collaborate uh, with a, a couple of universities that fit this profile uh, and, um, there is um, there are a couple of broad programs like Jump, 
and Sprint that uh, focus on um, uh, you know around topics for collaboration with uh, uh, universities. And uh, you know if if uh, the obvious strategy, I guess, from your side is to focus on things that are not uh, reliant necessarily on expensive infrastructure. And there are plenty of opportunities on the cloud and on the edge uh, where, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of progress can be made without, um, you know, having millions and millions spent on equipment. It's just, that's just me. I'm, I'm used to operating in the economically constrained environments when I was in the industry. And so uh, I would be given, you know, one point nine million of that million dollars, and uh, uh, and I'm, and be told to build thirty to fifty million dollar business in three to five years, and you know how I figure out to do this was my business, and so I had I had to uh, look for opportunities that uh, I could afford. Um, so I think this uh, con economic constraint sort of limit the operational space in which you can explore. But I think your question is a great question, and aside from you know, uh, uh, some kind of public policy solution, um, you know, appealing directly to the program managers, I think would make a lot of sense because they, many of them may not be aware of the incredible opportunity that exists at this, uh, this universities to cooperate. So perhaps um, Kevin and, and Serge, I can jump in with, uh... A similar question, and that before we we're focused on on workforce development. So, um, so I guess, Serge, do you think that uh, there is a gap between what our domestic education system produces and what we need to remain competitive in such a such a competitive environment that we are today? And how do we fill those gaps? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. So I I, I see two uh, two gaps that at least are. You know, my, I talk about uh, in the speeches that I make all the time. So uh, um, the first of this, I guess, is um, at the undergraduate level. And um, and there I see, you know, that a lot of uh, talented kids coming out of uh, four-year programs uh, that don't consider government service as, a, as an alternative. Uh, and uh, so I have been sort of uh, arguing to whoever would listen that we should have some kind of um, uh, strategy where we would consider reimbursing uh, all tuition uh, in exchange for two to four years of government service. And uh, here, you know, we're talking about engineers and we're talking about, you know, NSA, DOD, FBI, NASA. Um, they, so it's uh, sort of like uh, if they work for the government for, for some period, a small number of years, they would get all of their tuition reimbursed. Uh, and then the government essentially would get a shot to convince these folks that, uh, you know, national service is the right uh, or interesting and compelling career path. The government would have to at least uh, make an attempt to match the base salaries that these people would get in the real world. I'm not hoping, I, I, I can't hope that the government can match, you know, stock and uh, bonuses and, and options, but at least the government, if the government could match the base comp, uh, I think something like this could work. Um, and um, the other one, the other gap that I see is the total absence of uh, US uh, students in um, uh, PhD programs in the US, or I should say near total absence. Um, and that is sort of, uh, driven by economics, right? So uh, if you have an average, not average, but let's you have an engineer graduating with a four-year degree uh, over the course of uh, six years that otherwise it would take to do a doctorate, uh, this person uh, would perhaps uh, start at 100K a year. I'm talking West Coast here. I don't know how this uh, reflects on the rest of the country. And at the end of six years, we'll be somewhere close to 200K. So if we take the average of 150K a year. So that means what you're asking a US student to do is to forfeit 900K uh, to do a PhD, which will take six years. And when he starts, he will be making 180K a year, which would be less than what he would have been making if he didn't do PhD, plus he'll have 900K in the bank. 
So it's a terrible economic value proposition for uh, U.S. Uh, students. And I would, uh, I would advocate looking at how other developed nations are dealing with this. And uh, I do remember talking with some folks uh, in Sweden uh, where I think, and again, I can't vouch for this because this is a conversation that took place a while ago and I don't know exactly the elements of their program is that I believe they actually pay something resembling industry salary to the PhD students for the period of whatever five or six years that it takes to do a doctorate. And then they basically soften the economic blow. And, um, and as a result, they have quite a few Swedish students in Swedish universities doing uh, doctorates. So uh, I, I think uh, those two things, that uh, those are two kind of uh, mechanisms that I have been thinking about. Obviously, uh, you know, it would take uh, considerable administrative burden to, to get something like this done. I'm not even sure who in the government to even pitch this to. But yeah, I see, I see, I see issues uh, here for sure. Yeah. Um, we only have seven minutes left. Um, I'd like to get uh, maybe one more, one more question in. Um, and then um, Serge will give his uh, uh, last words and... Uh, uh, I have one, one question that I'd like to ask at the end as well. Uh, so there's a question about the toolbox. What's the rationale behind it? And uh, it seems it's not available to just uh, public, right? So it has to be performer involved. If you could elaborate more on that, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, the, the, the world of EDA is the world of haves and have-nots. There, there are... Uh, you know, the Intels, Qualcomm's, Broadcom's who consume huge uh, amount of uh, tool licenses and they get phenomenal uh, pricing. Um, the government is sort of on the opposite edge of all of this. Uh, even though there, are many, uh, there may be many designs going on in different parts of the government, uh, the, the government is not a single negotiating entity. It is unable to argue for any kind of volume discounts in fact, uh, the departments uh, within the government, the government labs, the, uh, the FFRTCs, they are completely uncoordinated. So the government, as a purchaser of uh, EDA tools and IP, has really been in an absolutely terrible and disadvantageous position. Uh, and they're, they're not particularly a lucrative market for big EDA. And there's really nobody to negotiate with to build you know, like an enterprise level agreement. Um, and the contracting with the government is horribly complicated. So uh, when I entered this uh, conversation, uh, you know, I, I, it, it uh, happened to me. I had um, uh, my performers when I just started at DARPA telling me they could not get access to some state-of-the-art IP uh, from a leading IP vendor because of complexity of terms and high price pricing. And, and uh, I said, okay, well, let me... Let me see what I can do about it since I've been essentially negotiating for a living for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so I came to an agreement with them uh, for a particular you know, use case, which is DARPA performers. And, uh, uh, and then once I was able to do that, this, uh, this arrangement received a lot of publicity and I started getting approached by EDA and IP players. Uh, and so we turned it into a real program. So this is... Uh, 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 I, would, I wouldn't say free, but almost uh, uh, extremely discounted uh, access to EDA tools and IP. Uh, I had to limit this so that uh, the commercial vendors do not, uh, to, to, to avoid the, this resulting in a channel conflict for them. And to um, uh, basically this is a revenue that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Mm -hmm. uh, because DARPA performers would gravitate towards open source tools uh, if they couldn't get uh, commercial EDA tools. And that would potentially result in outcome that's not as good as if they were using state-of-the-art technologies. And so we didn't want that to cause degradation in quality of their performers, performance. And so it's uh, taken off like uh, pretty well. And what's happening now is I'm being approached by other parts of the government saying, hey, we'd like to, can we either get under the umbrella of uh, the toolbox and have, for example, NASA uh, benefit from this and their, and their contractors, 
uh, there are members of the, their uh, organizations in the intelligence community that are saying that as well. And, um, and then, or can we replicate the toolbox model for our agency? So it's gotten a lot of momentum and uh, I'm almost, uh, and there's some really big announcements coming up uh, in the next probably six weeks. Um, and I, I, it's almost gotten too big for me to, uh, to run. So, I mean, I've treated it as kind of a hobby. I, it's not part of any of my measurable objectives or results. I'll never get any credit for it. And never, it'll never be mentioned in my performance reviews. Uh, so I'm just, uh, if maybe that will be my lasting legacy from DARPA that when my term ends, I will leave DARPA with, uh, you know, workable access to state-of-the-art design tools and IP. And I'll try to find uh, a contractual vehicle to get uh, somebody formally supporting it and taking it forward after past my service. Um, so I must tell you, questions keep coming, but unfortunately, uh, we only have two minutes left and some of the questions are just outstanding. I feel terrible not have enough time. I guess you're going to have to make a commitment. You come back again in a few well, I can, months. I can stay a little longer if that helps. I don't know if you... Uh, so if you... We can wrap it up and then folks that, are, that would like to stay, because I, I promise folks we finish always at one. But folks who ask the question, if they would like to stay, please, uh, please do so. Um, but before we finish this segment, uh, please say the last word. And usually I like to ask people, tell us something we don't know. Well, I'm not sure I have that, but uh, I'll, I'll, I have last words. So I, in my opinion, this is really exciting time in, in technology. I think what we see is the convergence of cloud, high performance computing, mobility, 5G, novel hardware architectures, uh, great software ecosystems. I think the computational topology is changing and the future applications are all going to be consisting of three elements, uh, you know, cloud, 5G, and the edge. Um, I would say my other thought is, uh, you, know, you, um, you know, it would be nice if everybody in the world could get along, uh, but uh, in fact, we do have adversarial nation states and we need to keep in mind when we invest in technology, we, I mean, as Americans, uh, how does this benefit US more than it benefits our adversaries? Um, and then as far as EDA is concerned, I do think that a rethink of core EDA algorithms is really the time is ripe for it. Uh, and we need to think uh, uh, cloud centric. And I really despise the concept of lift and shift, which is just taking uh, desktop or enterprise products and putting them on the cloud and call it done. I think the algorithms at their core need to be revisited in light of um, essentially limitless compute and storage. And also on the EDA side, I really believe that the next big innovation in EDA has to be business models. Uh, and the business models that, that do a much better job to serve American innovators. And uh, that's... Uh, None, none of this you didn't know, unfortunately. So I should have, I should have spent more time thinking about some surprising uh, <laughs> statement that wouldn't get me fired from DARPA. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Serge. I'll, I think we can finish the uh, first segment then.